Good afternoon. Good afternoon, all. Greetings from Mexico. Glad to see you all, colleagues. You are here with us. I also thank the uh, invitation of ANE, the National Agency for Spectrum of Colombia, who have invited me to moderate this important table rural connectivity, the reducing of the digital divide. And I thank Director Dr. Spinoza and Carlos Sosa. Besides, she's a, a chairman of the working group of spectrum management in PCC to CPL. Greetings also to experts and friends of this sector who maybe have the privilege to moderate during the next interesting session. We have Marta Suarez, president of the, the Spectrum Alliance, Ariela Lago, senior advisor of Alexander Garcia, responsible for policy for connectivity in Latin America, Facebook, Ryan Johnson, senior director of access to global market and governmental affairs of Bayasaf, Christian O'Flaherty, vice president, regional vice president for Latin America and the Caribbean of Internet Society, and Peter Bloom, founder of Rizomatica. So good afternoon, you all. Um, to all participants as well. And to open this uh, interesting debate, I would like to say, uh, tell you how we right now, so that we can then give way to our uh, guest experts um, in this interesting topic, quite relevant right now, especially in this uh, situation of pandemics. Uh, rural connectivity and the reducing of a digital divide, notwithstanding the efforts and achievements made, will continue to be our main challenge across the region. According to the intent ITU, only 63% of the world population have access, had access in 2020. And in the case of Colombia, the survey for ITC and communications in the household and DANI 2021 shows that 56% of households have one connection to internet and therefore the other 40% approximately remain isolated. And there is also a big difference in urban centers and rural centers and only 24% of households uh, declare to have one internet connection in rural areas. And in that proportion, 61 per employ a mobile connection as primary access to the networks. So this big disparity in connectivity between rural and urban areas, it can be observed across the entire region and obeys among other factors to coverage, uh, where e how easy is to access the level of digital education. But unfortunately, there are the households, the families that have the lowest income, those that live in remote places and to these technologies of information and communications that of course are indispensable to generate the economic and social development and also enablers of human rights. And that's what we take communications to all these regions and areas is one of the main objectives of all states, of all regulatory entities, institutions, and those that intervene in the design of public policies. And for that, it is required the support of companies. Uh, technological advances such as uh, cap satellites of high capacity, hubs, hips, uh, Redness land for networks, uh, Wi-Fi 6, fifth generation of IMT, service at KUK, and those new that are coming, uh, like UB, for instance, the white uh, spaces, the 3.5 and 6 gigahertz bank among others, while well, the end of they could represent an opportunity and they open a wide range of options to connect all, including, of course, the rural areas. Given the, uh, let's say, cost effectiveness situation, currently it's being discussed the feasibility of some of these options that could be even geostationary satellites that are considered as one of the main options to serve remote areas, especially in those countries uh, like Latin American countries that have a very difficult geography, difficult to access, and the provision costs of these services have been improved 
And it is possible today to have uh, services of $37 per month for internet, uh, five megabits per second, and a consumption of up to five gigabits. We also have the new solutions by uh, NGO and geo satellites offering rural connectivity with important characteristics. Um, I mean, uh, greater speeds, less latency, and terminal equipment that are smaller in comparison to the geostationary service. In Mexico, for instance, the commercial offer announced by Starlink that will be available before the year's over for satellite internet, uh, satellite internet with low orbit satellites, $119 for a speed of up to 100 megabits per second. And even though it doesn't have a ceiling for consumption, the cost of the equipment for users still is high, continues to be a challenge. Cups and hips are also another options, even in experimental stage, but they look to provide connectivity, fixed broadband connectivity for remote areas, including those areas that are in the mountain ranges and coastlands or deserts that are part of our region. And that, of course, it's, it's speeds up about uh, 19 megabits per second are possible. Wet slam networks, Wi Fi, and particular uh, 802.c of x is being analyzed right now to provide with a free spectrum wireless slam networks into 12 gigahertz, and the coexistence is being sought right now with the current system. 5G, no, the famous 5G uh, mobile phones represents in this case, an improvement in broadband services and communications of low latency, reliable and massive communications type machine. And we also, uh, the intention is to provide services to reduce the digital divide, uh, including land and non land stations with medium speeds of 100 megabits per second. And the prices are turn around $60 for basic packages, such as the, in the North of Mexico and the US. So, before this situation that I've mentioned the technological fact, it's important to update and know according to characteristics of our markets, rules and norms that will allow the deployment and development of communication systems that can be quite accessible and sustainable. Important to say that these policies mm, that must improve connectivity, must identify and harmonize the regional spectrum facilitating the development of economies of scale in order to have better prices and also look for agreements in route to just what we have heard to the WTC in two years. So ladies and gentlemen, it's evident that we still have a long way to go and that's why we must redouble our work, our efforts for the benefit of our countries and also in part of companies that is to promote the public and private investment and solve problems of access and uh, also to, to procure devices and digital alphabetization. So having said this, we have uh, experts, uh, which I will be given the floor in the order I mentioned them in the beginning. And we are trying to see, find the opinion over these aspects I just mentioned. And by start answering some questions such as that, how can, the industry, the contributor, or your organization contribute to facilitate access to internet in Latin America, in this case in Colombia. Also, uh, how to address the channels of coverage is necessary that users have a good quality broadband. And in this sense, what would be the additional steps to be followed to have a high quality levels. And finally, uh, if not, we can come back to this when the Q&A session starts. What are the current barriers, regulatory barriers that exist in the regions to reach these uh, remote places in uh, rural areas? So, as uh, having said this as an introduction, I will go straight to our experts so that in five minutes each, they can tell us about their opinion over this aspect, and then we will go to the Q&A. 
And for that, I have the pleasure to give the floor to the big expert and friend and chairman of Dynamic Spectrum, Marta Suarez. Marta, the floor is yours. Welcome. Okay, thank you. Thanks a lot for that excellent presentation. I want to greet all panelists that are here with us. Uh, for me uh, personally, it's um, quite uh, happy to be participating here. Congratulations to the organizers of this uh, very interesting agenda. So, um, here in your questions, well, let me start by saying this. Let's imagine, uh, I think that most of you are in your homes, or maybe in your offices in big cities, but let's imagine a scenario of the person that is not in a city, uh, but is uh, an isolated municipality somewhere in your country. I'm going to talk about Colombia, a municipality like San Gil in Santander province, 80,000 inhabitants. And let's imagine how these... Uh, people uh, think this is uh, common for Latin America. We have a, a, a road connecting this, uh, this village and there is internet, 2G or 3G, depending on the implementation and commercial plans that exist there. Could be 4G, not always, but we are talking about this municipality specifically. In the case of San Gil, uh, a neighboring town like Mogotes. So between San Gil and Mogotes, there are 34 kilometers of distance. So you may be in the park, let's say in the middle of the that town, that says, okay, the town has been covered by uh, this technology. But as I go away, I'm not in San Gil, I'm traveling to Mogotes. Unfortunately, the access to internet gets less and less. The signal, let's say, uh, gets... Uh, weaker and weaker and it just a point where it's not present and the persons that live there and they really start to uh, lack these options to access internet now commissioner mentioned in the territory world solutions that could be satellite solutions which of course are quite suitable for this region and there are other solutions that oftentimes we don't remember that are provided by local companies or internet providers right, basically so in this example i'm giving to you we can talk about package of 70,000, 80,000 pesos for a five megabit per second plan without a limit or ceiling of capacity or consumption. And the companies that to offer those services, the only way to do is to free spectrum because this moment there is no regulatory framework allowing access to other type of uh, schemes. Companies, as I said before, that are for profit, they, of course, serve a small area and they are sustainable. They can offer that and be able to operate. So that example I just gave you is quite real. It's the one that applies for many persons that live in this type of zones and towns. Some alternatives have been developed in time, and I'm sure panelists would talk about them. The communities organize themselves to look for access to, uh, to internet. But in many cases, the offer is quite limited. And that access to internet for those persons, that opportunity to be included digitally speaking is quite limited. From SA, we believe that it's quite important to have the right equilibrium between different modes of access spectrum. Different technologies have access to spectrum, non-licensed technologies, and licensed technologies, of course, the traditional ones, let's say, and lights, licensing schemes where they say uh, uh, when there exists a big ecosystem. What is important is to recognize that there are many stakeholders that are operating there that are closing the digital divide, but that require the access to spectrum. Now, in respect to the question, the more specific question you made, what can the industry you represent? Well, they say represent a group of companies uh, about half of our members are for non-profit. So we represent technology companies you know, looking for more better connectivity, of course, to offer their services and, and there could be more digital transformation. But there are also other entities that we represent that they just were looking for more opportunities so people can access the internet. So in that sense, it industry, what can do? First, to bring to public debate about having a flexible frameworks for access to the internet, not to put all effort in few technologies and few operators or stakeholders. Unfortunately, 
we continue to be the same, we won't close the digital divide. So we must get together and think about flexible framework and non-licensed spectrum. Since the DSA, we are proposing several alternatives that could be considered by the authorities. An example of that is the white space television. That is excellent technology, especially for zones where it's difficult to reach the deployment is extremely difficult. And UHF in some countries, VHF, the access and penetration is greater. So it allows for greater coverage. Mm. That technology, of course, can be complemented with others. We also believe that it's important to dedicate more spectrum for free use. In particular, we see something fundamental, the access to the six gigahertz band for water reliance, you know, for make it easier for Wi-Fi. The estimations of the economic benefit for Colombia, in case that decision is taken, will generate a significant impact of uh, $58 million in the next two 10 years and a more conservative center, $40 million for the next 10 years. Then we are proposing as well to consider uh, dynamic access schemes with bands that have been identified for mobile systems where it is possible to manage access by priority. Uh, licensed users uh, that have access to uh, spectrum by creating a broader ecosystem by providing a spectrum for verticals, something that was discussed this morning, generating, of course, greater opportunities for deployment, meaning more investment. So that is what we see right now. Of course, there are barriers to reach that point, but there are concrete actions being taken in between ANE, the ministry, and CRC that together can move forward in order to close the digital divide. Many thanks, Marta. Quite pertinent, your comments and reminders of technologies that um, they say can contribute with and in this sense it's fundamental to have spectrum for all uh, a balanced spectrum um, that need to be adjusted in function of what is available in each country so many thanks for that and uh, we will come back to you with some question most likely and now i'm pleased to introduce a person that knows this sector pretty well with a lot of experience and recognition, uh, how the region is behaving, for instance, and how the uh, systems behave, satellite systems in this case. And I'm um, uh, leaving you with Gabriela Lago, Director of Regulatory Affairs of Telstar. Gabriela, the floor is yours. Thanks, Arturo. Pleasure to greet you and my colleagues in this panel. Thanks to Anne for giving me this opportunity to participate once more in this Spectrum Congress. Uh, uh, representing Hughes. Um, uh, yes, I uh, congratulate you for this contract that continue to show is quite successful year after year. Now, next slide, please. Next slide, please. Well, I was saying, uh, I want to share with you the a huge contribution and the closing of the digital divide in Latin America, particularly in Colombia, offering access to uh, satellite internet, uh, geostationary for the time being and future non stationary, geostationary satellite. Hughes is one of the largest uh, internet, uh, satellite internet app in the world. Uh, and today it has over million and a half to two million subscribers. Hughes started its operations about 50 years ago, 71, development equipment for satellite communication. It was Hughes, a group of engineers there that invited that antenna that we know today uh, in the middle of 1980s as the precursor of satellite services that we have in this five decades continues continue to grow and expand and has a present in 425,000 places with some equipment uh, reaching 9 million pieces of equipment devices delivered in the 50 years with uh, thousands of hotspots. It was 1996 when Hughes launched in the US the satellite internet for consumers. That's what we know today, HughesNet. So HughesNet 
when then into Brazil, Mexico 2017, Colombia, Peru, Ecuador in 2018, and Chile in 2019. And at that time, this reached over 400,000 users in these countries. That's an important growth rate and a clear demonstration of the need for connection that we have. The main advantage of satellite internet is that it can reach places that are, that say no other technology can reach. In the, it's only a question of hours or a couple of days to deploy what is needed there. So Hughes is mainly focused in rural areas, remote places where the satellite service can really mean a difference for the people living there. In the next slide, we see a little bit what is the typology of satellite networks. Most of um, uh, internet satellite provider use a point to point uh, fiber and only satellite to complement. In the case in Houston, for instance, satellite technology is the only thing we use. And the way it is implemented is to install the antenna in the company household or the community and its communication through this satellite that is, of course, is also the country. Most of that infrastructure is located in the US. And this, and by representing an obstacle when fulfilling some regulations because it doesn't have a land infrastructure the measurement of internet speeds cannot be done in the same way as is done for other services given that the gateways are located outside the country and because it is located in geostationary orbit that is above 35,000 kilometers from earth the latency of the services is about 700 milliseconds so it's clear that the limitations there exist that we consider to define the rules for quality of service of the up, up link or down link speeds and so that we can use them in a more efficient way hughes utilized the and came out for, it's a key to have access to this band without interference as well as UD that is being planned for the next services that will continue along for expansion of this. There are two Hughes services Hughes provides today, Hughes Net with Jupiter 2 and Hughes 63W and the third one, Jupiter 3, but, uh, for next year. There are plans of $50 per month for 20 gigabytes that can increase to 50 gigabytes of offering double capacity. Hughes had an important growth in the last two years. However, this has not been sufficient to uh, have or provide the uh, access necessary to close the digital divide. And most of this is still not accessible for most users. In the next slide, we will see a little bit the focus Hughes has been having towards saying let's say having more accessible services with a solution called Wi-Fi Express in remote places, communities that let's say between five, 300, 500 inhabitants per place, per location, we have we're taking connectivity to 700,000 persons across Latin America previously didn't have any sort of access. And the next slide, we see that to provide this service, Hughes just identify uh, one of these communities to start with, 300 to 500 people, and agree with the owner of a grocery store um, a market to install the antenna at Web5. So the owner doesn't care of the grocery store, doesn't need to do any sort of investment. All the costs are assumed by Hughes and the uh, satellite capacity and operation of the service as well is assumed by Hughes. The, this is uh, coverage of Wi Fi is 8 to 100 meters around that store. This is um, Hughes provides the management of the services so that the owner of the store is the one in charge of selling the packages. The owner of the store doesn't need to cost or only in charge of selling the packages and the access service and to, um, to explain how the devices work. In this way, users can buy packages of 200 megabits, let's say, uh, data for less than one dollar with speeds of 25 megabits downlink and 11 up. Link. This is an option we believe is a win-win for everybody. Community has an access to Wi-Fi. In other words, there's internet, even though it's not its own home, but it's of course much closer you know, instead of walking hours to another town for data access. 
service is of good quality and uh, the grocery store only decreases his sales, he gets visited by the people and the, the digital divide is, is getting closer and closer to that community. So the solution for the closing of the digital divide is not a, a question of one person, a community or one the company, it is a joint effort. The more support we re the community receive in the deployment of the equipment, the, the provision of the service and facilitated the funding, the quicker we can she closed that digital divide. That's all on my part. I'm ready to answer your question. Thanks, Gabriela. Quite interesting to see how active with a combination of technologies such as you satellite, the geostationary, and uh, um, Wi-Fi transmitter antenna. We can have uh, attractive um, packages. Uh, hope for Mexico. In Mexico, for instance, we have cases of success and being supported by Facebook. Uh, they, um, they send in a big representative, Esther Garcia, uh, knowledgeable of the sector, uh, uh, knowledgeable in the industry, knows the regulatory part, knows the commercial part, uh, also technology infrastructures very well now from the digital uh, making their contribution to cut that device yeah welcome lister very much arthur it's really a pleasure to share your time with your friends that are so much appreciated areas Then this event, this is the topic in particular. As a matter of fact, there are very interesting topics in the and it has to do with the Columbus, excuse me, Latin American economy. Then we will take the people who are part of their Colombia. Now, very happy that they're here. In this sense, Gabby has already commented on the thing. I think this said, Lions probably do it, and likewise, I have to do it to have a whole set of projects. But then, the goal have the condition number of people that are connected to it, to be able to create a community. The solution that we have tried to implement as we were commenting to the rural hotspots, as Gabby mentioned, we are elementary and the seven efforts, and then we have our project that come with mobile operators. Or tiny this up so different but in all states it's all about it. that lack one of the interesting ways that we have colleagues are opportunities to have this market principles that have no existence. The and the and both principles have been in the issue of travel is more than ever. Meta can make it longer than offer these without the assistance of operating the colleagues that are present here of the satellite technology that we have present in here and uh, and a very important case in the region is internet for all and that's true uh, through um, the 4G basically and of course uh, in a very interesting way uh, to comment that in this case that we have in many of them 
uh, one of them is one of those samples of collaboration have to do really with the regulatory flexibility and the openness of, of uh, the authorities and so on. And then we have there like the open RAN that we don't have in our um, region. And uh, now we don't have a regulation that actually hinders them in any of these senses that it's good that it exists, the promotion there and the understanding, and it's a, a way in which we reduce costs to increment the competition in a segment that actually has a better liberty of the operators of finding operators and so on to make more efficient the communications. And then, well, another um, important way of collaborating comes through the way Marta mentioned, which are these dynamic spectrum sharing. The case of Internet for All perceives a secondary market of spectrum where operators rent their spectrum to a third operator so they can have these operations. So I think that all of this speaks of all of this, the principles of which I commented not long ago, collaboration, of course, regulatory flexibility. And another important issue that is central to all of this is um, a fundamental variable is the fact that uh, in order for this to be sustainable, it should mean or should be at, it's sort of encompassed in a, in, in, in a framework, of a business framework. In these rural areas, they're selling access to internet, the case of Viasat or the community networks that we have in there. So very likely they do survive precisely because there is uh, this vision of giving sustainability through um, the, the model of flexible marketing, and of course, uh, uh, so that they start as being accessible. So in that sense, I think that uh, we have to continue to promote these types of visions and so on, uh, an area of uh, regulatory flexibility and these openness uh, business models that we had, it was of interest when Marta mentioned it as well, which is the case of the impact that it may have decisions like opening the band of six gigahertz to Wi-Fi. In the case of Colombia, is an impact of about $40 billion from here in 2030. And in our particular case of the a &E in Colombia, they're studying the topic. And I think in a very positive view to do what's important for the development of these uh, offers. The, and in this case, also to thank once again, the time and the opportunity, and of course, open to Q&A. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lester. Effectively, one requires a combination of not only of technologies, but of business models, as has been mentioned. Not all solutions fit all. You have to find innovative ways. And for that, uh, in Latin America, we have been uh, doing pioneering, sort of seeking for these opportunities. And now we have a whole set of these different options. And as you have mentioned already, it doesn't, it doesn't only exist in several technologies, but several companies that actually are presenting in the sector these business offers. For them, we have a great you know, knowledgeable person who knows the Latin American Beckett. He's the director of for market global market access of Biosat, and he's always been an ally for Latin America on connectivity matters. So I now have the pleasure of giving the word to Ryan Johnson. So Ryan, the mic is all yours. Thank you very much. Uh, just like Senator Robles, I would like to thank uh, Annie for this excellent uh, um, uh, venue and gathering that we have had here. Well, Invesa is actually, is a broadband provided with several technologies, but mainly among them is through satellite. We think that high quality connectivity is something that should be independent of wherever you have it in the user. So in other words, it doesn't have to have a type of connectivity of high quality for urban area and another one for rural areas. No, simply should be quality throughout wherever the user is. So we have as a multinational companies in users and customers in residential markets, as uh, Gabri Gabrielle mentioned, also in mobility, 
in an aeronautical manner, so actually connectivity on America, Jet Delta, Aeromexico, JetBlue, uh, maritime connectivity between sailboats, yachts, and surface vessels for oil exports. And then we have terrestrial stations as well. And it is that mix of users and lines of business ensures the, the fundamental business of ISCOM. So it enables us to experiment and to invest in new technology so that we can have connectivity for the users that need it the most. We have more than 36 years in the market and the company started as a manufacturer for other operators. So many of the geo and geostationary ones, they actually use uh, machines that are done by Viasa. But uh, 10 years ago, we decided to do um, end user services and now we have now six satellites taking care of north america caribbean um, and europe and our focus has been to lower the cost per big gigabyte per second per user and the way of doing that is to improve the capacity and lower this in the satellites and we've invested a significant amount of dollars in r d in how to do exactly that and the result is our new constellation of three satellites that is called Viasat 3. The first of those three set satellites would be launched in the first half of 2022 to cover all of the Americas and each satellite of that constellation will have 1000 gigabytes or one terabyte per second. And this would break a record by fourfold. So right now it's 250, around 240. 250 gigabytes per second with my set two. So um, my set threes would be four times more efficient. And that has a direct impact in the economy of the broadband expressed by the satellite. I, using that capacity of, of uh, knocking down the cost in bytes per second, we have been able to offer several services that are new. And I would like to mention two of them that have been very successful in the region for the consideration here and for the development of projects in the countries of the region, including Colombia. The first one is internet community of Viasat. With the customer mix that we have, we can offer services that before or five, four or five years back, even seven years back, we couldn't have done that because the customers of national security and so on that pay more, they are actually subsidizing the users in areas that are more rural and not uh, catered. The running of the community is relatively simple. It is a, v a VSAT terminal of 0 0.75 meters, 75 centimeters that actually connects to a router, uh, an architect that is quite simple for the last mile of the technology. And we can use it between the Wi-Fi or Kiwi white spaces or other type of technology of uh, the latest era. And what is important here is to have something that connects with the device that the user has. Each site of this program receives 100 megabytes per second. And as Lester mentioned, one of the partners that we have that is very important for this has been Meta in selecting as to where to deploy and the running of those sites. So we are using the KA band or the, six, the 18 and 28 gigahertz with a high reuse of frequency to have a better efficiency in the network. And as was mentioned by the Robles Commissioner, we're using the G2s that have greater efficiency in terms of costs for the service. This service does not have any government subsidies. And for example, in Mexico, costs about 10 pesos for one hour of speeds between 10 and 25 megabytes per second. And in general, the latency has not been fundamental here. The majority of the people are using this service for uh, video of, of high definition and social network communication. So a WhatsApp call or a latency of a half a second has not been fundamentally in comparison with um, with bad quality service or lack of service. And so today in Mexico, 
we are covering about 2 million people who are not serviced by um, other means of technology. We have launched this project also in Brazil, Guatemala, Nigeria, and very soon it will be in other countries in Africa and in Latin America. So we have actually launched a society with a Pan-American company that is called Intercore so that we can provide this service in Colombia, Peru, and other countries of South America, starting with Viasat 3. The other project that I wanted to share with you, it was encouraged by the Brazilian government using the capacity of its national satellite and using a society between Viasat and Telebras. That project is called GSAT, which is called gestion of the, of the government and service to uh, citizens. In this project, the communications ministry is the customer, our customer, but the end users are about 3 million students and um, other users in schools and public uh, buildings in the country. And we were able to deploy quickly around 16,000 points throughout the country in each state of the country. In less than two years, we're also backing through that society, the Wi-Fi of Brazil project that is actually uh, giving minimum connectivity for the most difficult uh, places in, in the entire country. I would like to highlight very briefly in my last words, a couple of barriers that we have found in several countries of the region. And that includes among theirs is the blanket licensing or the oblique license of the blanket licensing to be able to have a, a quick deployment of hundreds or thousands, hundreds of thousands of terminals in a very quick manner. Also, the facility of coming into the market without any complications of having to register there in different institutions and just to start reports before having the license. And lastly, I would like to talk about the stability of the spectrum in the region. We have invested billions of dollars in this constellation of ISAT 3 that it's actually to have this stability that this spectrum that they will be using, these satellites, will be available for the region for the time that one has expected for the useful life of that installation that's around 15 years. And with that, I will be finishing my comments and so on, and, and I will be open to Q&A. Thank you, Ryan. Very relevant, this the last point is, is in terms of regulatory barriers, especially the ones that were in charge of updating the regulation and so on, and also to give certainty to the investments so that they have had stability or, or some predictability in terms of the spectrum use. And now to complement this vision, we have another very knowledgeable person and regional vice president for Latin America and the Caribbean, Christian O'Flaher, a person that knows very well all of these limiting factors of uh, taking internet to all the corners of the region. So please, Christian, the mic is all yours. Thank you very much, Arturo. And thanks the A&E for the invitation. Always excellent the, these gatherings that they organize. And I would like to follow the trend of thought that we had proposed as the first, what is the, 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 the way that these institutions can actually help to close the digital divide in the rural areas. And of course, I would like to start with the internet society and why we are so interested in working together in this exercise. The organization was created some 30 years by the first internet users so that the internet continues to be open, reliable. And it's a global condition that has a chapter in just about every country. And then the idea of bringing internet and allow it to be open access and to allow to connect the non-connected. It's actually from the foundation of our organization. Since the 90s, we have been working at that time to actually bring internet to the regions that were less developed. Many of us worked in the universities of Latin America, putting those first links so that we can actually get to the internet. At that time, one wouldn't expect to come a provider to connect. We didn't expect that we just had to, we had to get to connect the university to go to a place where there was a connection that they had there was something that we had uh, 
which is the, where they had the university networks in the US as well. And that's where it was most developed. And in time, the organization began to evolve since we had that internet there. Now the internet service is, um, is a commercial affair. It's a very good business. It's a very good opportunity for these uh, companies and those who live in, in who live in cities. We can select who is the supplier, who is the internet provider, and to have connectivity. But of course, that in places where there isn't market as market size, that model just doesn't work. And what happens is that after thirty years of having a successful model to bring internet to more than half of the population of most people in the world. Now we have all the regulation, all the process here actually adapted to that commercial model. Even the equipment, the services, the technical solutions, it's all thought through so that the operators deploy their rules and they connect their user. But we have proven that that, mod, that model doesn't work 100% of the cases. And the, if half of the population is without connection and the connection is not growing as we had it in, in years, we have a challenge to have uh, an option thinking in those areas that are not connected. So the role of my organization is to work with those local chapters so that we can identify those barriers to help in those small projects or the pilot projects, just to show what other alternatives can there be to connect people to internet who were not connected before, and then to work with regulators and governments so that we can identify barriers and to work jointly to uh, knock those barriers down. And here is where we have learned Plenty, and one of the things that were ev evident when during the confinement of due to the uh, pandemic, uh, it's no longer connectivity. The, the ones that don't use technologies, uh, it was not there to close the, the divide. It's, uh, we're marginalizing people from their most basic uh, rights who, doesn't, who don't have access to internet, can't work, can't study, can't have access to remote health. They can't have access to the very system that the very states implement there so that they do their, their relationship with the state. It's not only the digital gap or the ones that actually limits us to better jobs or access to better education. Now the problem is even greater and more evident because our responsibility has also grown with this. And we need to change that uh, so that we can permit to have the complement with models that have flexibility in the places where commercial uh, IPs do not come there. Then we have the traditional model where there's very strong regulation barriers or, or there is an order where places in competition there's, they can interfere Clearly, where we don't have any any of those who don't have a service provider, doesn't make any sense. And they actually can build their own service in the places where there are several uh, providers. And then we have to try to rethink very much of the access to the internet service and to think it better where the style of internet to actually come there to the origin. We actually do the effort to learn to build the networks and to connect to internet. And we would have to permit in those rural areas where um, there's never going to be enough incentives for coverage by companies, the very community can actually build their own infrastructures uh, accompanied by, with the aid of the state so that they can get to these suppliers and and or to cover some town is not a model that actually competes with the current ones. No, much to the contrary. These uh, tiny ESPs, uh, wireless, and so on, the small groups that build their own network, they will end be. So we have to look at what those barriers are. And uh, many a times they have to do with 
the informality that they have in rural communities and those processes that we have thought through in companies and firms, but they're all barriers. Some are, are not barriers, some of them are averages. If, if a commercial company had to deploy there, for them would be highly, and then for the locals, they're not that high. They are the owners of the free infrastructure. They know the sites and so on. They can put available their own houses, their own towers, their own whatever they have. So that makes it more economically, not only the deployment of a network, but actually the running of their, if a commercial operator has to assure their, that they have their available, the companies to give support for maintenance and for security and so on, that actually increases theirs. But if their own neighbors are responsible of their own network, those costs just disappear. So we have to find a way of flexibilizing our processes and our regulations so that we can allow um, these, uh, deployments in rural areas. Thank you very much, yes. Thank you, Christian, very much. Very adequate, this very last one, this one, because this last point that you mentioned of new possibilities of allowing them that letting the very communities who actually do these deployments and I can do as a function of their advantages and their activities to provide the services. It's actually a model that we have had success in certain countries. In the case of Mexico, we already have it on one area in the community areas, like in other cases, the shared network, but precisely speaking of the community ones and new models, we have Peter Bloom here, who is a founder of Idiomatica, and then they have our ample experience in these type of solution. It's to him that I will give the mic so that he lets us know what his experience was like. Thank you very much, Commission, and good afternoon to all. Next slide, please. Yes, sir. Yes, I'm making an echo of what Christian said. I come in representation of Rizomatic, but I want to speak of community networks, which are community efforts, yes. It's a bit to build the network towards the service providers and and what is wireless, what is wireless. If you could go to the next slide, please. And then um, if I wanted to focus myself in Colombia, I know that this is an international conference, but I think there are certain matters that are very specific and very important in Colombia that I think that we should touch upon. Today we come, I have been working with several communities in different parts of the world. Some of these networks require having access to radioelectric spectrum, and that is difficult. As the Mexican commissioner said, in Mexico, we do have certain advantages, and we have started with working with a network of indigenous communities that actually, so that they can build their own uh, mobile network with the interests of many other communities that are remote in other places of Latin America. We have started these similar processes in Brazil, Colombia, Nicaragua, and the issue is always the spectrum. How can we have access to the spectrum? Be that of EMT you know, or other bands and so on. And if we're not an op a renowned operator, can we go to the next slide? So um, that for me and for the work that we actually do is a challenge. And it is a topic that is quite important. There are other important topics that we have in the spectrum that are the prices of interconnection, thinking in, in rural uh, areas or remote ones that are actually are trying to connect with a bigger network with a wholesale provider. What we saw is that the prices to have access are not always very fair. They're not very equitable. And then the cost in the city versus the cost in the rural areas is actually and they're not in the same slide and uh, I'm going to share that and then the need to see the financing schemes of the universal funds of universal coverage so that we can actually finance some of those projects today it is very difficult for a community uh, network to have access to these type of funds and then we need them for subsidies for the operator plans to broaden their coverage zones. I don't, we don't have a lot of time, so I'm going to go quickly to go there. So, of Colombia, I want to share certain uh, topics that worry us 
that we won't have to give them emphasis. And one of them is that the new ICT laws, we didn't recognize the community networks as an option, as an important player in the sector, in spite of the fact that there's several in Colombia. And then what we have from there is actually a set of challenges is to have access to financing, etc. So, so just for you to know there, we are actually a company, a network in Colombia, and all the pictures there of the presentation are of this network in the, and it's a network in, in Buenos Aires, Cauca, and we manage there after some time. Um, and then that was not renewed, and they were reviewing it for more than a year ago for them to renew. So there is a network that has been built. There is a community that have already cho shown their capacity, their capability to operate a network. And nonetheless, they had to turn it off because they didn't have the possibility of using the necessary frequency. That worried us a, lo a lot and that actually there is not a pathway for it to be resolved. It's actually there halted and lastly, about the issue of uh, a interconnection, there are some terrestrial networks that are important. In Colombia, there is a national network. However, by trying to have access to this with being a small community network, we see that there are prices that are very differentiated here. And here we have a graph of sharing the differences in Colombian pesos, not in dollars, but nonetheless, you can see there that they should save a very high prices. And then we can see how in Buenos Aires, Cauca, that this network that I told you there, they pay 120,000 Colombian pesos per megabytes per month compared with Bogota, which is 538 pesos. So by being in a very remote area with a lot less economic development for Bogota, they're paying way more than that in the sort of carrier network and we're going to leave it there without because we're without time but that's one thing that i wanted to share with you thank you very much uh, peter i'm very grateful for your understanding in respect of time and then we we'll have three type three fundamental points that we have lived in mexico there's the cost of the spectrum in mexico the time that you have of the spectrum that is not only the problem for the community networks, but for the commercial ones, or at least in Mexico, the part of interconnection that really uh, continues to be a challenge that the others in the funds to start because you require some additional kickstart of the, that respect. The regret is something that we can't regulate, uh, and even regulate is us, it's the time that is non-forgiving. So on this occasion, we have to leave it at that but I think that we have actually done a great sort of rapporteur of all the challenges that we have in terms of regulation, harmonizing in issues that are very specific of the community networks. And with that, I believe that we have covered and we have given a full panorama of, of uh, the ones who issue policy as well as companies. And then we have there, and then we have there, it's the great pending one that we have in our region. And then we're uh, uh, grateful for this and actually very uh, kind of you for being so understanding with time. Bye-bye and see you soon.